in most environments, by far, the operating system you're going to see is Windows. You'll see servers, you'll see desktops. So let's start with Windows system vulnerabilities and exploits. You can categorize Windows operating system exploits into some general categories here. And most of the exploits are, are written sort of with these things in mind. Remote code execution is any kind of vulnerability, any kind of condition that allows an attacker to execute arbitrary code, meaning whatever they want, and from a distance. That's why they call it remote, so over the network. A buffer or heap overflow. Now, this is a programming error that allows attackers to overwrite allocated memory addresses with malicious code. And I think we need to, just for a moment, make sure you conceptually understand what a buffer overflow is. When a program launches, be it an operating system, be it a service like a web server, um, be it uh, Microsoft Office, you know, Excel or Word, or a media player, or Skype, or anything, when, whenever any program of any type launches, it wants two things. First, it wants threads, which are the smallest unit of execution of code that it can run. And it wants those threads so it can run its code on the uh, CPU. The operating system, the, the primary job of the kernel, of the core of the operating system, is to schedule threads to take their turns on the CPU, or CPUs, or CPU cores. So that's one thing. The other thing that a program wants, has to have, is some memory so it can load itself and so it can load documents or files or whatever work it's doing. And so it has also a little bit of spare memory to accept input and queue output. We call these buffers. So um, have a little bit of memory here so that as input is coming in, like a person is typing in their name, or data is coming in off the network, or something's being loaded from you know, a, a removable media, it needs these input buffers. And uh, well, it needs output buffers as well, but we're not focusing on that. What a buffer overflow is, is this. The operating system says, OK, you can have x amount of RAM because the um, application asks for it. It says, I need x, whatever x is, a certain amount of RAM. And the OS, if it has it, will grant it. And if it doesn't have it, it will maybe page out some least recently used code to make some room. So uh, anyway. The, uh, the application has a certain amount of RAM in memory addresses. Now, when it needs to take input from a user or the network or something, or a microphone or a camera or something, it will um, allocate an input buffer so that this data can come in. And uh, when you're programming, you allocate input buffers in a lot of places because you need to take in data. And then you do something with the data. You only get so much. And this, this is the design of the program. I only need x for this one activity, whatever this activity is. So I just have x. And the whole program is like this. And the buffer is just like this, OK? And um, it's a certain amount. Now, when the input comes in, it is up to the developer who wrote this program to draw boundaries around that amount to basically say, the input that's coming in can only be so big. In other words, you can't have a first name that's 250 characters long. It just doesn't happen. And even if it does, shorten it. You know, so um, it's up to the application developer to actually, in the programming language, specify limits on how much input can come into this buffer for this particular activity. Makes sense. Many application developers do not do this. They depend upon the rest of the app to control that. However, we can spoof that and just provide more and more and more and more and more input without stopping. Now, what do you think is going to happen? As more and more input comes in, pretty soon, and if, if there's nothing stopping it, pretty soon that memory is going to overflow. I mean, th that input is going to overflow past the boundaries of that little bit of buffer. And it's going to spill over and start overriding 
surrounding memory addresses which are being used by that application or service. Now, if you can get it just right, one of those memory addresses is going to say, OK, execute, and when we're done, go back to where we were. So we call it a return pointer. So buffer, writing buffer overflows is not easy. It takes a lot of effort. But when they work, boy, are they good. <laughs> because now that we are past the bounds of this little buffer here, we can ar execute arbitrary malicious commands because the program is doing it for us, because we've put it in some other memory address that is expecting to, to run something. That's a buffer overflow. And that's the gold standard of writing an exploit. Not all exploits are buffer overflows, but that's what we, st we strive for, at least when attacking a service or an application or some part of the operating system. So that's a buffer overflow. A heap overflow is a buffer overflow, but a heap is a temporary, dynamically allocated amount of memory, as opposed to one that is structured when the application launches. So you can have a buffer or a heap overflow. This is a programming error. In other words, I didn't write input boundaries. I didn't um, filter what's coming in. That allows attackers to overwrite allocated memory addresses with malicious code. There's also denial of service. Now, this is any condition that allows an attacker to use resources so that legitimate requests can't be served. And that could be eating up all the bandwidth, eating up all the CPU, eating up all the RAM, eating up all the disk, eating up all of the acceptable uh, connections. There's memory corruption, not necessarily buffer overflow. Um, this is, a, again, a programming error. It allows attackers to access a program's memory space and hijack the normal execution flow, not necessarily with an overflow, though, but just overwriting something. There's privilege escalation, any condition that allows an attacker to gain elevated access to a compromised system. In other words, to go from normal user to administrator or administrator to system. So these are the common Windows operating system exploit categories. And actually, they apply to any operating system, not merely Windows. So let's talk about the Windows kernel. This is the core part of the operating system. It manages memory. It schedules processing threads. It manages device input output. It runs in what we call ring zero privilege level. It has priority over all other processes. So to understand what the rings are, now you should have studied this in A+. Um, there are rings of privilege that are enforced on a CPU. In an Intel CPU, they define four privilege levels that are enforced at the hardware level on the CPU. Ring zero in the middle, well, I don't know if it's physically in the middle, but ring zero is the most highly privileged part of um, execution on the CPU. And the core part of the operating system goes there. Then around that is ring one. So it's kind of like a bullseye. There's ring zero, one, two, three. There's four of them. So ring zero is where the kernel goes. Ring uh, one is where um, sort of like the core system uh, services go. And ring two is like where device drivers go. And finally, ring three is where user applications go. That's the least privileged. So ring zero runs the, the Windows kernel. It has priority over everything else. If you can have an exploit that attacks the kernel, you can escalate privileges. You can destabilize the entire system. Now, yes, you will get system privilege, and you may very well crash your whole system. Memory vulnerabilities. Um, there are plenty of programming flaws. I mean, application developers, they, they don't have time. They don't know how to, to uh, test their code carefully. They're trying to get something out and get it to market so it can be sold. So a memory vulnerability, this is a programming flaw that results in improper access or improper handling of objects, in other words, bits of code, stored in memory. Memory corruption could lead to arbitrary code execution or denial of service. If nothing else, we can do denial of service and make the memory freeze up. Um, it's often not logged by the operating system. If you have uh, a memory-based exploit, the OS often doesn't uh, log that. It very often will destabilize the system. 
There are some common Windows memory exploit types. Use after free, meaning um, when we don't need this bit of memory anymore, there's still some code in it and some malicious thing goes in and reads that code. Uh, we talked about the buffer overflows and the heap overflows, um, where you're basically uh, um, filling in too much input and overwriting surrounding memory addresses and, and, arbi and uh, executing arbitrarily. Uh, there's integer overflows, where you basically, um, I need to do a, a simple mathematical operation. And um, so to do like a multiplication or a division or something, I only allocate a little tiny bit of memory just for that. But I have uh, an operation that needs to use more than that. And, uh, and yet the app does not uh, necessarily um, allocate it. Or we could just have memory leak denial of service. And, and the way that memory leaks is, um, you know, when a program needs some memory, it usually needs it to do something specific for a short while. And um, programming these days is what we call object-oriented. So you have a thing, an object, that does something. And uh, so I, I need to allocate a little memory for this thing to do its thing, this object to do its thing, whatever it is. And when it's done, the program's supposed to give the memory back to the OS. Well, poorly written programs don't. So I keep on asking for more, 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 and I never get it, give it back when I'm done. And pretty soon you have memory starvation. So we call that a memory leak. All of these are vulnerabilities with memory. So those are the most common types of Windows vulnerabilities and exploits.